This is your host, Mark Ford, and today we are going to be speaking with some hemp farmers out there, the ones that are going to be growing hemp there in lower, lower Midwest United States. Thanks for joining us, and here we come. We're going to release, release the names of all the people that are going to be on our show today. We've got a two-hour show for you. First, we got Amy Ensel from United Files. Group. It's Stephen Cutter from Hemp for the Future. Bert James will be on with us from Homegrown Agriculture. Joaquin Rodriguez from Gen X. Shay Alberman, Alberman from Gen X. Ken Grubbs from Miss Delta Hemp. He's down in Mississippi where he's at. And John Escobar of Fort Vital Fuel Columbia. And I really, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And Amy, are you on with us? I am, Mark. Thanks for having me. Nice to be You're more here. than welcome. No problem. Yeah, I'm excited about the call, the, the, call, the conversation. It's just an, an honor to be a part of this. So, oh, Absolutely. Ben, I think you're online too, are you? I am. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. No, we're happy to have you here with us. The, uh, the Amy, I, I guess we're going to go ahead and reach out and hit you up with United Biofuel first, right? That what is United Biofuel doing with Ford Biofuel there in America? We are carving out quite the program for biofuels in North America. Uh, United Biofuels is a, a distributor for Ford Biofuels, which is a global hemp farming agenda that supports the biofuel category. And it is quite the agenda driving hemp growing for utility. It is driving that category. This is going beyond CBD and growing for hemp. It is beyond the medical. And so uh, what we're doing with biofuel is, is quite prolific. I'm very excited and privileged to, to be distributing uh, what you're producing with the farmers worldwide and, um, you know, looking at what we can be doing here in North America with the farmers in the States, in Canada and Mexico to be supporting the buyers that Ford Biofuel is servicing with a, a farm and OEM seed to sale program. That's what's so exciting. We're, we're really ushering in that new paradigm of growing plants for fuel. Gosh, that's, that's a new concept and um, something to just embrace right there is how can you put a plant in an engine? And um, this isn't new. And I think this really segues into how did you start Ford Biofuel? And what's behind that Ford Biofuel name, Mark? Why don't we talk about you? Because this, this is really about your vision and um, uh, the, the, the charge that you have created and, and been preparing um, for every country that is looking for sustainable solutions and circular economies. Why don't you talk about your lineage and, um, and who you are as a person and the founder of Ford Biofuel? Well, thanks, Amy. Basically, what I come from a, 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 um, I come from the military is where I come from. Uh, I was in a service for quite many years, and I chose to be a soldier rather than a farmer. I was raised on a farm, and the idea behind me being a farmer when I was 18 back in the 80s was, forget it, there's no money in it. And if you remember, Willie was doing, Willie Nelson was doing farm aid at that time, so there was absolutely no money in being a farmer. And I decided to go into the military. I since retired out of the military and lived in, lived in Colombia, South America. And I decided to stay here and watch the market with the, the hip market grow <laughs> as Colombia was starting to legalize. Well, the funny thing about it was, guys, is that when everybody started to gravitate toward the CBD oil side of it, and the CBD side of it was for medicine and for um, and vaping and for, and for smoking oil, 
and all of that stuff. But it's like, well, I don't think that's what I want to do. But I'm still thinking, well, there's there's still money in it. And and then I started seeing all the snake oil come out and all of the fake um, oils that are people are releasing. And I can buy one oil for $6 and they're selling the same oil for $6,000 a liter. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's not right. So I, I just kept watching people move and gravitate toward these $20 seeds for CBD. It's like, nah, what can I do? I remember my family back in the 30s and in the back in 1910. That's right, Henry Ford. He was making hemp biofuel. Right? And he made a hemp car, like the fiberglass car, out of hemp. And he was making fuel from this stuff. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Why don't I let these fools go ahead and do this CBD? And I'll just go ahead and confiscate the hemp. And technically, that's what we did. So using his his idea from almost over, almost, oh, no, it's over 100 years ago, um, we decided to go ahead and move forward with rekindling that idea again and creating biofuel from industrial hemp. What happened? We started playing with the idea and put it out there for people to think about and say, hey, do you think it might go good, might not go good? And sure enough, we got a lot of bikes back. Some of them, very large, very large aircraft companies, right? Uh, transportation companies reached out to us and said, hey, can you make aviation biofuel? Well, yeah. Are you sure? I said, well, i got to have the right formula because I don't know what goes in your engines. And working with another major company in the United States, we designed a formula for hemp that came from the base of Henry Ford's biofuel. And now we have a formula that absolutely works with um, jet aircraft engines. The idea is now is this is where United Biofuel came in to help distribute all of this fuel that we got to distribute around the world. And that's how the biofuel industry down in Colombia got created. So fascinating. So what does it, yes, the what, that is in it in a nutshell. What we did down here, though, Amy, is we took the, um, the farmers in Colombia, for example. Uh, back in 2012, Obama signed a deal with Santos uh, called a free trade agreement. And what that did was it put over a thousand farmers out of a job that grew coffee. And these people lost their farms. And here I'm watching this happen all over again, like what happened in the United States back in the 80s. And what we decided to do was do a joint venture with the farmers here to have them grow for us. What happened with that? We got overwhelmed. And we got actually, in a good way, that's not a bad bad thing. It's a good thing. We it's got a good overwhelmed problem. With, <laughs> with a good problem, yeah. We got overwhelmed with all of the people who wanted to do business with us and bring their, their crops or bring their lands to us for us to grow on. So what we did was we kept moving forward. And after about a year, we ended up with more land than we know what to do with, right? And if we have more land that we have seed. So what is it going to take? I mean, what does that mean? What is it going to well, take? Means is, it means that we're going to keep moving forward. We have enough contracts and enough meat on the table to put a lot of people to work and a lot of farmers to work. Right? And this, this is why we have migrated additional to extend our, our service and our contracts into the United States. Is it because you have more buyers than land? We have more buyers than land, yes. So you need farmers. We need farmers. We need what farmers that the, want to work a long time with us. Why don't you extrapolate on what that JD looks like for the Colombian landowner? And how you envision well, that for the United well, States? Well, the Colombian landowner, 
what we do down here with the Columbia landowner is we supply them with all of the all of the service, the technology to get their for their crops growing. We would supply the seeds. We would supply the know-how. We supply the sales. All the farmer has to do is oversee the property and make sure that the property is safe. And that's and and in this case, help us plant it. And there you have it. That's it, it, it's a turnkey system. The seeds already so, sold before it even gets planted. Well, that sounds like pretty low-hanging fruit for a farmer out there that's looking at their 2020 agenda. If they haven't figured it out, there's an opportunity here to actually be planting with a purpose, with a specific genetic, with the right financial support to grow against a buyer. And isn't that really the missing puzzle piece that everyone's been looking for? That is the missing piece. The problem is, is that the farmers right now, it's exactly the same problem in America that they have here. They grew a lot of product. For example, let's go back to the CBD. What happened last year? Everybody was growing CBD. And what happened to the CBD market last year, Amy? Well, it tanked. It tanked. What happened to the farmers? I mean, that was, I said that nicely. <laughs> That was sugar coated. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. You know? Um, what you were saying was nice. I have to agree. Yeah. I mean, we, we saw, and I have, I have shed tears with farmers that have lost it all based on bad consultancy and uh, a buyer that walked away or never existed. And so, um, you know, I would, you know, tip my hat to a gentleman on the phone like Shay Alderetti and Juan, or um, excuse me, Joaquin Rodriguez, these guys are up in, up close and personal with the California farmers on the cannabis side, on the THC market, and, you know, there are pains that the farmers are experiencing in this industry, and, you know, the headlines are really making a farmer question if this is actually a real thing. Can this industry exist? Absolutely, it can. Um, I believe Joaquin's on the phone with us also right now. Yes? Uh, hey, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just called in here a minute ago. I, I appreciate the warm introduction. And, and yeah, uh, speaking on the on the farmer side of things, that's uh, definitely something that we experience here on the cannabis side, on the licensed cannabis market. Uh, the, the, to be honest, the farmers are our lifeblood. You know, they, they provide the fuel for a lot of the businesses henceforth. And, uh, you know, it's really important for us to build those strong relationships to make sure that we don't uh, overtax or, or undercut the farmers uh, because, you know, they got to eat too. They have families to support. Uh, and then at the end of the day, they are the backbone. Uh, we can't do anything without them. So uh, it's definitely something that we've built over a long time uh, within our industry. And, um, and what is your connection with the co-ops? Uh, so when we work with the co-op, we uh, they have a collection of, the, of licensed cannabis farmers uh, that we can tap into for the resources for flour and for uh, trim for production. So we, when we contact them, uh, they introduce us to their network of farmers within uh, you know either the Humboldt or Emerald Triangle, Mendocino or Santa Barbara area. Uh, a lot of those places where you know, you have 10, 15, 20 farmers uh, with you know one acre to 10, 20 acre plots greenhouses and outdoor and uh, you know they help us introduce to the people that have the product that we need or are able to help us scale and utilize their property uh, for their cultivation to support our manufacturing process yeah super uh, you working with any of the wine the wine industries up there uh, some of those some of those are on wine country actually yeah yeah because uh, that industry kind of goes up and down as well uh, but yeah out there in Mendocino and in uh, Santa Barbara uh, there are some vineyards that have been uh, sectioned off and then replanted as cannabis. So yeah, we can't have a little cannabis maybe. wine, but maybe in the future. Yeah, you can only have a little bit. Yeah, you only can have a little bit. But I mean, you know what works for me is the 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 the, the hip beer that I've seen. Um, oh, there you a lot go. Of hip beer going on. Right. I, I thought it was kind of neat to see the hip beer. It was funny as hell to see how they put that all together. But hey, hey, we gotta go to a commercial, but we'll be right back. Come back. This is uh, Mark Ford. We're live in the radio here on Hemp Farmer Radio, and we want to 
revisit what we were discussing about the CBD market tanking on all the farmers out there that are trying to grow. Um, how bad, real quick question, Joaquin, how bad did the tank in California? How bad did the CBD market just go, go you know, belly up? Oh, man, it, uh, it went from being around the high twos per percentage point all the way down to about 80 cents within a matter of about three to four months. So it tanked wow. well over, yeah, it tanked well over half to 70, yeah, 60% uh, in about, in about a quarter. Know, when did that happen? That was uh, middle, starting in the uh, middle, so middle of 2019. I want to say like June, July, August. Going into that, and it just yeah, maybe? every every couple weeks, yeah, every couple weeks it would just drop by like a half a point. So uh, one week it'd be uh, two dollars, next week it's a dollar eighty, next week it's a dollar seventy five, and you just see drop, drop, drop. Yeah, every week. You know, I had a po- I have a podcast out there, and I was just really given CBD hell, right, and how bad that they sh- people on Wall Street need to find a nexus strategy. And the next day after we had 13 million listeners on one of my podcasts, the, the, the market just dropped. It dropped like four points. And I got a lot of people sending me emails saying, you know, why did you say that? Why did you say that? We lost a lot of money. People are losing money. And I, all I could say to them was, told you so. Yeah, it's just, uh, uh, I think the stock market likes a lot of hype. Uh, they like to hype up things because it makes uh, increases value uh, but with no foundation people want to buy it because it's the newest thing that's being talked about but there was no uh, wasn't a lot of foundation for the economic support of the growth of CBD as a, as a molecule the way it was in him it wasn't like uh, no one had like large pharma contracts where they were doing this particular thing to actually you know, on that subject if there were a buyer for CBD like pharma that was saying I need to put out a billion units of Contract and we're to do this specific, you know, this farmer co-op alliance support system that you have for, for biofuel. Uh, then you would have had obviously market stability, but, but there wasn't. Uh, I just want to preface that for the listening audience when Joaquin is talking about two points down to eighty cents, uh, two dollars a percentage point means if a hemp farmer is growing a CBD strain that is testing at 10% CBD, the market was $2 a point. So that would mean it would be $20 a pound for that 10% CBD. And that $2 a point went down to $0.80 a point. So I just want to help the listening audience understand um, how it is measured from growing it and how we actually monetize the CBD content of the plant. And really, not only is it the marketplace very volatile and, and non-existent and who's defining it and, and creating that right supply chain that anyone can trust, it's non-existent. And I think that's really what Mark yeah. is, is, is talking about and warning the farmers against that is, it is not there yet for the FDA, for the pharmaceutical realm, in the health and wellness. I mean, we applaud them, and, and, and I think we all want to see it. You know, we see the evidence and the science is there. However, as a farmer, growing with hopes that there could be a buyer is just a fantasy. Yeah. I don't see Thank the you. buyers coming out of the woodwork, uh, you know, to, to, to help the American farmer. I mean, they're not even coming out of the woodwork to help the Colombian farmer right at the moment, right? So, I mean, there's no, there's no as you say, seed to sell. There is nothing like that. I mean, there are people doing CBDs in Colorado and in Washington State and in Idaho and every Oregon, excuse me, Idaho is illegal. But in those states, are doing a pretty good job. And Northern California, if I remember right. And they're doing actually pretty good, pretty good. But the problem, here's your problem. You got China shipping in the, the, the oil that they're saying is this, and it's probably vegetable oil. What do you call it, Amy? Snake oil? <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah, I think you call it snake oil. But the, um, they're, they're bringing in these, these, this competition, and there's a company out there that is white labeling. You buy into it, you put your own label on it, and you resell it for what you want. 
and then it's just destroying the market. So what happened is the best thing about what we're doing, what Ford Biofuel is doing, and uh, with working with United Biofuel and African Biofuel and, and IT Holdings and all of the other companies that we got the big contracts with, they um, what we're doing with them is is what we're doing something that is exactly the same across the board. No one can change our price because we're the ones to control it. We we supply the fiber, we burn the fiber, we convert the fiber into either a um, a cotton or we convert it into a fiberglass, or we take the root and we convert that into a plastic. We take the herd and convert that into a hempcrete or a fuel. And when we cut the tops of the flowers, we have the, the, the flowers for plant food or animal food and the seeds to regrow for the next cycle. And every bit of that plant is used. Nothing is wasted. On a CBD plant, you have people spinning it all out with these extractors, and it comes out a green allergy, and they, and they call it biomass, and it's worthless. You can't even burn it to make anything out of it. You can't even ferment it to make fuel out of it. You can't even use nothing. You can't use nothing with it because everything that's useful has been extracted out of it to be made for oil. So what we're doing is, instead of wasting the plant, we are using it for charcoal, right? When we burn it, we have coal. We're going to have millions of pounds of coal to reuse back into the system, to put back into the, to the for energy, um, to create electricity. We have all different facets of how we're trying to put this together and how we, 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 we will win. There's no lose to this. <clears throat> and what I hear you saying, Mark, is that, the way your program works is a lot different, and it is a seed-to-sale program. From seed-to-sale, you are giving the farmer the seed, and you are buying it back from them. So that is not redefining it, but actually providing a system and method a farmer can slip right into and actually be in control of and trust because uh, Absolutely. rains the the infrastructure and the the point to point of okay what's next you have already figured that out and so that is a part of your JV with the farmer direct which everybody is exactly for. what it is it's a win 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 Amy it's a win 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 the farmer wins we win the economy wins the environment wins everybody wins right and. Here's one other thing that you're going to love to hear. We were told by the Aviation Administration that the amount of biofuel that they've ordered from us, and once they be, are able to use every bit of it or continue to re, reuse every bit of it, um, that we will help reduce 3% of the CO2 and the atmosphere of the world by them using our biofuel. Yeah, that's a huge dent. If people don't understand, 3% is... Huge, and that's just biofuel alone. And this green buffalo that you're talking about, dissecting and parsing out all these different wires for it, I would love to really understand that, you know, footprint of sustainability. Um, it's got to even be larger than a 3% ROI. Absolutely. For, for and we're going to have to do that when we come back. Right? We, are to go to a, we have to go to our radio spot. But I will we'll return in just a few moments. Hey, this is uh, Mark Ford again, and welcome back to our show. And right now we have Shay Outerready from Gen X, and he wanted to bring in uh, some information that he's got, and we, we welcome any, any anything that anybody has. And Shay, take a look hey, what you got. Hey, Mark, how are you? Thanks hey, for having me on today. I appreciate it. You know, I just You're wanted to, welcome. you know, put a couple put a couple words out there. Uh, it's amazing what you guys are doing and how you guys are utilizing this, uh, you know, this plant. And, it, you know, there's so many elements that it can help, and you guys are really adding this infrastructure. And I think what's going on is, you know, I'm from the California market, and I've seen Oregon and Colorado and California with their transition into, you know, CBD and hemp. And a lot of these farmers, you know, have kind of lost their butts out on, you know, 
the CBD side of things where they kind of overgrew, overplotted, and now they never had no outlet for this. So, you know, listening to you guys and hearing the visions you guys have for the Ford biofuels and the and the, the awesome, you know, opportunities there are to use the byproduct of the hemp. You know, there's so many areas that you can use it in, and it's just amazing to see the infrastructure and what you guys are putting together and, you know, the strains. And I think that's where a lot of these city farmers have lacked in the, in the, you know, in the past is they didn't have the infrastructure. They weren't educated on the strains to use and et cetera. And I think a lot of these farmers, you know, got head over heels with a, a large amount of product and they had no outlet. So with you being able to put these contracts together for the fuels and the textiles and et cetera, it's, it's amazing to see what you guys are doing. And I think this is definitely the way of the future. And, you know, as CBD is growing from state to state, you know, you guys have a really good pulse on a direction and, you know, the infrastructure is really what I, I'm believing in what you guys are doing for the farmers and it's amazing you know a lot of these farmers are out there you know switching over their land from you know other crops to, to hemp and with the support that you guys are adding with the strain and the SOPs and the way to grow it is, is amazing I think that's what our industry has, has lacked for many years now and you guys are really stepping up to the plate doing that thank you how do you see the top of California also you know California is a big agricultural State. There's a lot, um, you know, Northern California was is really big in the cannabis space. And they've been growing, you know, weed, weed up in that area of, you know, Humboldt, Trinity for, you know, hundreds of years now. And I think that this industry is, you know, in a, in a growth stage. And with the guidance of your guys' program, I think that it could, you know, be a very, very, very good thing for these farmers. There's some farmers that are involved in this industry right now growing on a large scale. And I feel like with the guidance of your guys' SOPs and the understanding of the contracts that you guys are securing, I think it'll allow these farmers to really just put their head down and do what they're best at, and that's farming. That's what we want. Yeah, having a, a supporting alliance like you guys and what you guys are putting together is, is amazing. I, I've seen the lack of that in this industry. Amazing. Uh, and it looks really amazing. You know, the, it looks a lot different. Looks a lot different. What exactly? It looks so much different. Well, it does. It does look different. It, you're not putting a five dollar seed, and I'm elaborating. I'm embellishing, but you don't put this expensive seed in the ground meticulously in rows. It, this is not a roadie bush that you're growing. You're growing something that is tall and lanky. It looks like bamboo. You're planting it close together, and um, you're planting it with love, and you're planting it against what Shay's talking about SOPs and a program that can support the farmer actually growing it and sending it off and preparing for the next crop rotation that's going to nurture the soil and the air around him and sequester carbon. I mean, let's just, <laughs> in every single way possible, anytime this hemp is, is interfacing something, it is a benefit, whether it's the soil, the air, the human, the water, hemp is, doing something it's it's interacting at a molecular level again what shay and Joaquin are talking about Absolutely. but it's not the cbd it's an industrial strain and and you're providing it so there's a lot of different things that are different a lot of delineations between growing for a biofuel agenda utility plastic cotton textiles all of that has to have a plan and a purpose. And, and Mark, you know, we are all so excited that you have meticulously mapped this out in every country, how the farmer can win and how the buyer can win. Well, see, the buyer's going to win because they're gonna, it's going to be able to pass the savings back on to us, right? When, when we're selling fuel uh, under a dollar a gallon, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to us no matter what. No matter well, what, it comes back to us. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. They, they don't want to buy a, a pile of crap, and you, and it's the wild west out there. So again, it's it's mm -hmm. providing a quality experience for everybody involved, from seed to sale, from the farmer all the way to the buyer. You are providing a program that has integrity, that has merit and meaning, where everyone is sustaining and actually enjoying the experience in the marketplace together. Absolutely. Hey, I just sent you a photo, Amy. Bottom right, have a look at what it says current. Okay, one second. 
Yeah, you're going to love this. I'm pacing right now that because is, I'm just so passionate yeah, about you're this. You're going to really pace when you read this. Guys, let me explain what's going on. I'm doing simulcast over on WCKY, WKRC, and then WCKY, and then they're simulcasting me out to 138 other radio stations. And I want to thank every one of them guys for carrying me. Thank you for reaching out and wanting me on your line and, and talking today. Additional, we have been broadcasting this on the web for people to be able to listen to on the Internet. And I just checked our connections, and it looks like we have about a million two hundred thousand people listening to us just on the internet alone. <laughs> well, that's great! Hi, everybody! Happy Monday! Yep, happy Martin Luther King Day, by golly! Absolutely, we are doing. You know, we're launching this week off strong, really strong. Sorry about you too, Joaquin. Absolutely. But um, that, that's what. But I'm glad that we have these many people that are that that imp impressed or that serious about wanting to fix this problem and Absolutely. wanting to help with this. And I, I want to thank everybody for listening to us today. I really appreciate it. It was such short notice, and I'm so impressed at how many people jumped back on. Um, and I apologize for yesterday. I just could not get all of the content together. To, to put out to all of you people listening. So thank you again so much for coming in and listening to me and, and carry it on with us. I do appreciate it so much. And we are working around the clock, 24-7, building this program out to onboard farmers to grow against existing signed and sealed buyers that you have waiting for their raw hemp materials and their refined products through hemp innovation. So I'd say the call to action listeners, if you're not a farmer and you know of a farmer, they need to hear about this conversation because this is, this is something that's real and tangible that they can plug into and trust. And if you're a buyer, you're going to want to learn more about Mark's program, clearly, because we do have uh, transparency and traceability for quality raw hemp materials for innovation. Listen, the UN is throwing down a super tall order in sustainability. So by 2030, we will be required for sustainable commodities, communities, and new technologies. And that's exactly what this program represents in every category in the marketplace. The hemp farmer is the hero. We are growing our commodities. So look at every category in the marketplace and say, wow, someday hemp is going to replace that. It's going to be a main ingredient or a foundational component to this object. Whatever it is. We live in a very plastic environment, down to the rug we walk on. We got a lot to do and a lot to farm because there's a lot to transform. You know, we've already, we already have our sustainable fuel registration number in Europe, right, for us to be able to ship to Europe and uh, all, all of the EU. And that, that's a required commodity you have to have to be able to ship into those countries. You have to have that SFR. And we were we were issued the SFR rather quickly. It was really impressive how quick we got that. So, what does that mean for the sustainable fuels in general? With you being a member, well, what it does is for us is it lets us it, it helps us control the amount of biofuel that gets spread around in Europe, and in doing so. We created the OBFC, which is the Organization of Biofuel Commodities. And what that does is it controls the, the, the price of the biofuel, similar like OPEC. OPEC pretty much controls the price of crude oil. Well, we would be the, we are the ones that are controlling the biofuel, uh, that goes into the EU and in South America. One thing that America is going to have, we're going to have to have a real hard time with America. I see it coming. The United Nations issued a proclamation that anyone who is a part of the UN cannot charge tax on biofuel. And when you go to the pump and pump your gas at Ameri in America, you're paying it better than the dollar fifty in, in taxes. And with us, you're not going to have to pay tax. I mean the the the, the aviation the, the aviation corporations are not paying tax. That's why they want to switch to it. And since it's not being driven on American highways, they can get away with it. 
the marine the marine diesels, the big ships, they can get away with it. But America is like, well, if you're going to drive on our highways, you got to pay tax. So it's it's going to be a it's going to be a hard it's going to be a hard um, brush to shovel. But I mean, irregardless, we still have 187 other countries that we we we're going to be supplying to. So can we talk about like how the hemp farmer engages? So they they engage. Let's say they sign a JD contract with you, and they got a, a five year contract. You send them seeds. What else is there that they can envision with you on this call today that that um, they could look forward to that they can count on? Well, they What's they could definitely count on that their crop is pre sold, right? They they could count on that. There it is. But the crops already pre-sold. I mean, for the next five years, their crops are sold, right? Um, that's one thing they can count on. They can count on me supplying our company, supplying the seeds, right? And they can what also count on time? making harvest time. Is 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 they got to harvest for us? I mean, most farmers have all the equipment to harvest. It just takes a regular corn cutter to get it to, to get it harvest, right? But okay. the 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 one thing that the farmer is going to notice is that this is what this this is the one that's going to drive it home is that on our crops because we have this project already sold and as we have the contracts to back it up um, the farmer's got a, a guaranteed contract for five years Amy and what does that mean to the farmer that in one year he's going to make more money than he made in ten. And it's 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 guaranteed. That's the best thing about it because the contracts that I have signed are ten year contracts. But I'm gonna give my farmers five year to get their feet wet, right? And if they wanna re sign in five years, then we'll bring them right back on and sign another five year contract with them. I don't wanna walk them into something really long. Only the people that are buying from us that I lock down. Sure. So when when it comes to harvest time uh, do they have to do something special to it? I mean, the the white CBD is managed is like you know you wear white gloves because you don't want to shake the trichomes, right? So how this how is, is industrial this hemp? Right. This is industrial right. hemp. They're going to double cut it. They're going to cut it at the root and they're going to cut it at the flower at the top. And the the top flowers get thrown to the back of the combine, and then that gets put into a, a different uh, wagon where it's going to be sifted for the seeds. And then the bottom part's going to get baled like hay, right? And then it's going to get shipped to whatever location we decide to ship it to, whether that's in Mississippi, whether that's in Alabama, or whether that's in Arkansas, or even in El Paso, Texas. We haven't Are decided you, where okay. we're going to ship it at. But so the point is that when okay. it leaves that property, when, mm -hmm. that, when that farmer loads our trucks up, he's, he, is, he is completely checked out. So he's not required to decorticate it, to sprinkle anything special on it, to spend more money doing something to it. You want nope. the plant, and you're coming Absolutely from the plant, and then the, and then they and will got to keep the seeds for the next season. That's it, right. The only thing is that we cannot resell the seeds because we need the seeds for ourselves, right? We're not trying to be seed sellers. Um, he needs to keep his seeds, dry them up, get them where they can plant them again for the next season, and then. Go at it, right? Well, we will keep him supplied with seeds. Now, there will be farmers that will, won't have seeds, and there will be farmers that have more than enough seeds. Well, that's where the co-op comes in. For example, let's say Kim Kim has a thousand acres over over in the Mississippi Delta, and he wants to get started in this. And we have a farmer that's just maybe a hundred miles from him that's got twenty five tons more seeds than he needs. Well, I would have that farmer send him maybe five or six tons of seed so he can get planted, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's the way we keep it. We kind we of keep them seeds in the ground. Otherwise, they'll go bad pretty quick. Okay. And what you're saying and what I hear you saying in my listening is that you are the one that will carry the brunt of the headaches and the responsibility of getting the resources and the infrastructure the farmer needs and that you're going to meet them where they're at. And a sophisticated farmer. Well, well, actually, with thousands... Green Buffalo was going to do that. I was going to <laughs> Green Buffalo's head in the net part. Absolutely. I'm, I'm handling what I handle with. I make sure the farmer gets his seeds. 
I make sure the farmer gets everything he needs. I make sure Green Buffalo gets everything they need to take care of the farmer. And then when it comes time to get that out of the field, I make sure that's, that stuff is taken care of and sold. That's right. That's right. And then so, Green Buffalo does all the stuff in the middle. Correct. So from seed to sale, the farmer's really being taken care of and pampered. I mean, they really are the hero. Pretty it's much. They, they got, they got, I can't say a farmer's got an easy job. That wouldn't be fair, right? Uh, mm -hmm. No farmer has an easy job, right? And well, I'm making it easier for them. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, is that... Well, we'll make it easier for them, yeah. No, I mean, the question yeah. is, how easy would it be, Mark, for the corn, tobacco, soybean, cotton... Fill in the blank. Whatever, whatever the farmer is farming today in America, it's going to be for them to come over as an organic farm or a farm that's on, you know, toxic soil. Like there, there's so many snowflakes out there that that have a different profile. So talk about that. How how there, do you engage? There are a lot of flakes out there. <laughs> that's right. There are a lot of flakes out there, and and the problem is is that we got to get to where they can get, they can do something with it and get the people in, uh, involved where they can do something with it. And it doesn't stop there. We've got to keep moving with it and, and bring in more farmers and bring in more farmers. People have said to me, Mark, you're going to make, make a big mess of the corn market. And it's like, well, I don't think it's my fault. We, we know what fault that is and what happened with the corn market. And yeah, what I'm sorry. trying to do is I'm trying to protect our farmers. I got burnt on the corn market, right? Mm -hmm. And probably will never go back to corn again after they get started with me. But, I mean, what happens, happens, Amy. And, and I'm, I'm in it to protect our families and our farmers and our economy first. Absolutely. So do you think they'll be able to win just based on growing fiber? I mean, is there a market for that that can sustain beating what they're already selling? Do you think they, that a farmer can make more money with you versus tobacco or cotton? Yes, yes, ma'am, they can. Well, Amy, I'm going to have to take a break here. We're we're getting told to get take a break. Um, we'll get back to you guys just a little bit. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be right back. Hey, this is your host, Mark Ford, and welcome back to our show. We are here doing the Hemp Farmer Heroes Radio Network. And what we're trying to do here is get awareness out of what the new business that's coming to America, the, the additional, what the farmers can do to make more money and can enjoy life a lot better instead of worrying about corn and soybeans. Yes, we understand that corn and soybeans are a very, very important part of the American culture and the economy, but there is also other things that can build the economy as well. And, and we left, with, before our commercial, we left with Amy asking a question. Amy, you want to re-ask your question so the, so the listeners can re-hear it again? Absolutely. Well, we touched on how you're relieving a lot of headaches for farmers and taking some um, unnecessary responsibility out of their hands on a business note in the seed to sale division. However, what we haven't uncovered yet in your joint venture contracts with um, the farmer, how are they financially going to win? Can you please compare contrast a tobacco or cotton farmer and can you meet or beat what they are growing today? Okay, well, with the cotton industry, the and Kim, you're on the phone with us still, right? Kim Grubb. I am. I am. Kim, okay. Kim, you, you can let me get Kim's opinion on this one, Amy. He knows how bad the cotton industry is and what's happened with it. Kim, you want to chime in there? Correct. Um, yeah, of course, the farming industry has been decimated in this part of the country, the southeastern United States, as well as it has. Um, all over the rest of the country. And there has been a renewed interest um, in farming because of hemp. And the main anxiety that farmers had was what were they going to do with it? And so it's made people hesitant to get into it. But some of those uh, questions have now been addressed, Mark, because you're going to tell them exactly what they're going to do with their crop. It's, it's astounding, really, that uh, they're going to get the support they're going to get from you. The, the, the idea, 
Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to no, jump sorry. in and say, you know, um, financially, what they're growing, there's more water used and more, more or less fiber produced when you compare contrast just from growing against fiber, ver fiber hemp versus cotton uh, fiber, right? But at the end of the day, their acreage, what does their, what does their contract look like? Are they going to win bigger? The, 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 the farmer contracts are doing the hemp. Is that your question? How, we we speak your question, Amy, because it wasn't very. Well, clear. you know, cotton cotton farmers are getting X amount of dollars per acre. So, what would they be right. be receiving by get, making X amount of dollars by growing hemp instead? Well, to actually throw a dollar sign on it is almost impossible. Because it depends, like like Kim can tell you, he can have a thousand acres there in Mississippi, but then they're going to get flooded, right? And when they got flooded, they go from a hundred thousand dollars to zero because the crop is gone, right? And we have to start all over again. I mean, it really varies. I mean, and then and in the Midwest there or in the Southern Midwest, we had what was it last year, Kim? Am I correct? Two hundred and forty-seven tornadoes. Correct. Okay, I mean, and it destroyed a lot of farms also. So to actually put a number on it when we don't know exactly how much land the farmers are coming with, what kind of uh, soil they're growing with, and how we're putting it together, it, 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 it's kind of almost impossible. But I can say this without with, with a reasonable doubt, right, that the farmers that grow our hemp, and doesn't matter what size property it is, Right, they will definitely, for sure, guaranteed make more money growing this hemp than they will in tobacco or cotton. I guarantee it. Because the, the thing about it is, is that the demand for this hemp is the supply and demand. We are the supply and we have the demand. Right, And the farmers are the ones that are going to help us get to that point. Well, Mark, and this I is Kim again. There's also some wonderful uh, benefits that, you know, are economic uh, and social in their nature. I think one of the best ones is in these areas where uh, soil has been polluted by fertilizer and by uh, cotton poison, different sorts of things, that this plant will actually remediate the soil. That's what uh, that's what that's what they do. I mean, this is what it does. It helps re it helps replenish the soil. I read somewhere, Kim, that it makes it puts more nutrients back in the soil than winter wheat does. Mm hmm. But uh, but that, I, I I I was amazed when I saw that. But then again, it shouldn't be a surprise because look what it's doing for the uh, the environment when the airplanes are burning oil fuel instead of fossil fuel. We're depleting the, uh, the, the CO2 instead of depleting the ozone, right? So, I mean, it, 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 it does go hand in hand. That's right. And one of the other things that you and I have talked about is how to resuscitate um, all this infrastructure that exists all over the country where there have been farms that are no longer operable in the ways that they once were because we're going to need storage facilities, drying facilities, processing facilities, can actually bring back the infrastructure of farming from decades ago. Perfect. You know, the thing about it is it's the toxic soil farmers that we're, what you're talking about. They remember down there in Alabama, <clears throat> they had that company called Monsanto that went through mm -hmm. there and just ruined a lot of property with all their chemicals and all of their, 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 their poisons and stuff. And the, the, this here, is pretty much guaranteed to help them, right? It helped replenish that soil that's supposed to be non growable for 2,500 years or whatever right. I said it was. I know they closed down Fort McClellan because they said it was a toxic dump, right? Mm -hmm. um, right now, we also have with us Bert James and um, Stephen Cutter from Homegrown Agriculture and Him for the Future. These guys are working with Puerto Rico and they've got. Pretty much the same thing going on with them down there, and they're going to be working with us also. Bert, how are you guys doing today? 
Fantastic. Thanks for having us here. You're more than welcome, guys. What you got going on down there? Well, if this is directed to Burt James, I'm uh, helping Stephen in Puerto Rico make plans, but I'm actually based out of North Carolina, and we've got a, a large group of farmers here uh, that came together back in 2016 uh, to basically chase hemp and, and all that opportunity that it represented. And now I've kind of stretched my legs across the country and uh, basically go wherever there's a good, solid group of farmers that choose to pursue hemp. I, I do my best to lead them in the right direction and kind of help them not make some of the mistakes that we did in the last three years. A lot of mistakes made. A lot of mistakes made. Been a, lot a, lot of, of mistakes a lot of mistakes made. made. It's sad. Really sad how many mistakes have been made. But, I mean, how do we learn, you know? Well, I'm I'm tired of learning by making mistakes. I'll say that, and I'm um, very fortunate to have met some gentlemen from uh, over in Europe, and then also in Canada, and now obviously Colombia. And so I think it's time for the farmers to understand just how global the market and this effort is going to be. And um, I believe you represent that mark, and and that's why I'm I'm pleased to to kind of help spread the word about what you're trying to do. Well, cool. You know, I've, I've, I've been to Puerto Rico before, and it's a beautiful country, right? And the only problem with Puerto Rico is that God bless their hearts, they, they, just, they just live in the, what do you want to call that? The, the area that our God doesn't like. <laughs> you know, he, he's either throwing a hurricane at them, or he's throwing earthquakes at them, or another hurricane, and then an earthquake on top of the hurricane, right? And it's like, it just seems like he don't like Puerto Rico. But, I mean, these people are resilient. And I, I have to give them a lot of credit. I mean, as, as much as they go through, as much as I've seen these people go through over the last few years, right, and then bounce like they do. Um, yeah, I can speak on Puerto Rico a little bit more, too, Mark. This is Stephen Cutter. So go um, right ahead. I've been, Please. Yeah, and uh, so Bert and I have been uh, friends and colleagues for a couple of years and uh, putting together these plans on cooperative infrastructure rollout for, for the hemp industry. and. Um, like Bert referenced, you know, what you kind of have put together with the the agreements and offtake for farmers, it covers uh, uh, one, one of the bigger problems. And so what, uh, what we got building in Puerto Rico, I've been coming down here for about 10 months. We have uh, a headquarters in Rio Grande uh, at the Hacienda Siesta Alegre. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll teach hemp cultivation skills uh, for to both local cooperative farming networks and also uh, for travelers alike. Uh, but it'll also include hemp home building uh, workshops. So it'll include uh, energy projects, uh, permaculture, and agroforestry. And then uh, travelers will also get a component of uh, the ecotourism. We'll get the surfing, the, the rainforest hikes, um, and we're we're building an incubator model around this too with the universities um, and bringing in some of the top material science. Um, my passion for the last nine years with this plant is. Uh, is figuring out how and who is doing all the, the things from concrete to, to bioplastics to biofuel now um, on, on a large level. And uh, they're going to bring this plant to, to the modern age um, in a way that can help heal the planet and, and liberate the people and, and have some fun in while we do it. Absolutely. Make a little money also. Make the farmers money. You know, the, the thing about it was is when you say bring the plant to the modern age, did, I said a little food for knowledge. The first American flag sewn by Betsy Ross was made with hemp. Um, I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but the, 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 that flag is a hemp flag. Additional, Correct. the British uniforms were all made from hemp, right? And they were made in, and made in Virginia, where this was before the Revolutionary War. And the British government would pay farmers to grow hemp, right? And the the four clothing and four textiles, and because of what happened with Henry Ford, um, the government got worried uh, when he came out with the biofuel and the hemp fiberglass that there was no way to then to tax it, just like a prohibition where they couldn't tax the alcohol. And it all comes back to you know history will always repeat itself. I mean, hands down, it will always repeat itself. And the the cool thing about it is we have better knowledge and more understanding 
of how hemp is good for the economy and good for the for the uh, for the world, for that matter. As bad as we've made a mess of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's the ideal circular economy crop. You know, uh, even when you look at what was mentioned about cleaning up brownfields, uh, we're putting together plans to to train veterans on cleaning up brownfields down here and then converting that into energy through biogasification. So the this plant represents endless opportunities as well, and that's why I think um, people are, are drawn to it because it has um, it's the most genetically diverse plant on the planet uh, and can have the, the most uses. And so um, that's uh, you know Burton and I's uh, passion and focus is you know how do we how do we scale this uh, for a sustainable um, economy future. Speaking of other countries, we have. We have a lot of different diversity on our, on our network today. And additional, I have with us John Escobar from Colombia. He works with Agro Cannabis Group for Biofuel down there, down in Colombia also. And John, are you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, man. How are you? How's everything going? Oh, oh, very well, thank you. John, John, if you want to chime in and tell the people what's going on in Colombia with the farmers, right? Uh, how the farmers are reacting to the, to, to the movement of what we're all doing. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And hello to everyone. Uh, this is a good moment for Colombia because we're just still open uh, our country to the hemp and to cannabis uh, industry. Right now, we got a lot of good offers. We have gotten a lot of lands here in Colombia to get the hemp because the hemp, as you know, is the future of the world. If you can work about plastic, about about uh, the biofuel, and here in Colombia, they're really excited because the land here, most of the land in Colombia is not productive with anything. I mean, they're losing jobs, they're losing opportunities because, you know, our war just ended and they don't have many opportunities to, to, to grow anything that gives us real, real money. When we show the business plan to farmers, they realize that the hemp is the only business that will make their lives. So we are getting contracts to get land in many areas of Colombia because one of our advantage here is that we are really, really good. We got lands because we, I mean, our lands are good because we, got, we, we just got one season and it's summer season all, all year. And we got good conditions, low cost, and low low salaries and everything, so we can make it happen here. The hemp is the hope of Colombia. And I'll tell you guys that we can here get all land we need to develop all contracts we can get. And the farmers are excited. We have talked about people in the middle, in the east of the country, the west of the country. The owners' lands are excited because they don't see any other profitable business here in Colombia in agro industry besides hemp that's pretty much what i gotta say here and we got landed we got land in many many areas in colombia and as soon and as we begin the project more owners of land are going to be here with us more or less have you noticed a big upswing on our hemp our, our hemp industry since since what we have started here with the farmers yes of course yes of course they got seen all the opportunities and their expectations are growing because now they know that it's a good business for the future, you know? Uh, right now, we got more landowners than they used to have. They're more interested in knowing about the project and know how to sell the hemp to the world, more or less. Uh, Bert, do you see the same thing happening over in Puerto Rico? Yeah, I just I just listened. Great. Uh, Bert James. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think um, Do you you see the same thing happening in Puerto Rico that John was just explaining? I think for right now, a lot of these propositions, uh, they definitely have a bit of a leg up because, like you said, you've got multiple growing seasons, so your your learning curve is going to be a lot quicker. You're going around on crop. Uh, you're going to have the ability to, to fund more infrastructure sooner because you're going to be able to, to almost have a continuous cycle. And so that, you know, some people are intimidated by that, but it's actually quite exciting because that gives you an accelerated chance to learn about the genetics and exactly what we need to do for what parts of the plant we're going to utilize. So, yes, 
I think Puerto Rico uh, has an outstanding opportunity. I believe Stephen's taking the right approach where he's setting up more of a, a research approach where a Puerto Rico, which may not have the massive acres that Columbia does, you know, it, it makes sense for them to use their climate to do the benefit of R&D. And also, as he said, you know, he's, they're already pursuing uh, popular things such as agritourism, which Puerto Rico was just made for. So yeah, every, every country is going to have to approach it in a little bit different way, but it, it does afford an opportunity for everyone. That's everything. great. That's really great. But, hey, um, Kim, I got two minutes here before I have to go to the commercial. When you hear what's going on in Columbia, Kim, and then you hear what's going on in Puerto Rico, and then you hear from Bert up in North Carolina, what does that make you think can happen in the, in the Midwest there where you're at? I think it's just endless. Um, I think it will be so exciting to go to a farmer and say, if you'd like to grow this crop, and I know that you're already interested in it, we can absolutely take care of that for you from the beginning to the end. What I mean, what a guarantee. Perfect. Okay, guys, i got to go to a commercial, but, hey, we'll be right back for the second half of our show. Hey, this is Mark Ford. Welcome back to... I want. I keep wanting to say Happy Hemp Farmers. I don't know why, but it, it just kind of sounds good, I think. Happy Hemp Farmers. But actually, it says Hemp Farmer Heroes. Hemp Farmer Hero Radio, our network here to bring the farmer enlightenment to them that they can understand another crop that can help them pay for their property, build an economy, save their asses, I hate to be so blunt, and because of what's happened to them in the past, and bring them out of where they're at now. Um, what what we got here is something that is unmistakably perfect for a farmer. Uh, one of the, one of my friends told me that we're making the farmer the godfather of the godfather promise, which is the offer they can't refuse. And that's what I want to do. I want to make sure that they have an <laughs> offer they cannot refuse, uh, but in a good way. I'm not going to cut a horse's head off and throw it in their backyard or in their bed, but. The Amy, you had some, some comments you wanted to make real quick here? <laughs> yeah, sure, on that note. Well, you know, let's bring it around financially, okay, and talk about how the farmer can win and beyond the farmer, how anyone that wants to be a contribution to ushering in a new paradigm in sustainability, plant-based innovation, hemp innovation, if, if that is you and that is your passion, it's what you're standing for, this next segment is all about uh, the opportunity to fall in alignment with Ford Biofuel and the stock program that this company is putting together to support the farmers. And this is really a Jerry Maguire moment. Help me help you help me help you. So maybe, Mark, you could uh, just roll out what you have in regards to um, – your private stock offering, and then we can just talk about the impact. Well, what we have is we're, we're offering out stock for our company. We were issued, we, we have issued over a billion shares of stock, but we've only releasing 250 million shares. And the idea is, is to keep it under a dollar or keep it within, uh, within grasp of people can afford right now. And, Unfortunately, the, the, the good problem is it's not going to stay that low very much longer. Um, the idea would be is to have the people come forward. I mean, we, our, minimum, our minimum amount is like $100 or 100 shares, and it goes from 100 shares to 100,000. There's, there's different blocks that you can purchase at different prices. And the, the idea is, is to help build build a finance capital or build a capital for our farmers up there so that we have the, the, the funding to be able to support the farmers immediately, get them the seeds they need immediately, get them, uh, get them in the ground, and that way they have a guaranteed product. And we, you can go, we have our website up that people are going to, and it's buystock.fordbiofuel.com, buystock.fordbiofuel.com. FordBioFuel.com. That's where you want to go, and you want to go there and buy stock. I mean, it's it's. It, I can't begin to explain 
what kind of a ground floor opportunity this is for people who've never bought stock before. This is a private stock. This is not a public stock. I, I refuse to involve the governments into what we're doing because when you, as we know of history, when the governments get involved, everything gets mucked up. And we're not trying to have muddy water all over us. So if we control it and our people control it and we take care of it and we don't let the, the government or anybody that tries to take over in, then everybody wins, including our farmers. And that's the more important. The farmers have got to win on this or I won't do it. Right? And the the idea is is I was raised in a farm, so I know how the farmer feels and how they think. And the idea is my heart is with the farmers. No matter what, my heart was with the farmers. You can ask anybody that works with me. I always tell them, give me a horse and give me a shovel and leave me the hell alone. Right? And that's exactly how I am with it. People can understand that going and getting the stock, they know within a year it's going to be $30, $40 a share. It's a win, win, win for them too. And the I can almost pretty much guarantee that's where it's going to be at. But as that being said, I mean, realistically, with what we have in contracts with the fuel, we what, Amy, what is it, $178 billion in contracts we have now? Amy? Yes, that's just one category in the marketplace. You are right. That's just one, $178 okay. billion in, in signed and sealed contracts. Just some signed contracts that have been verified by the local financial institutions and by banks in America have, 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 have approved these contracts that these are real and legitimate contracts. And that there alone, once we commence on those contracts, then we, we all know what the stock's going to do. It's kind of logic. It's kind of one of those big duh moments, you know? And that, that stock is actually supporting the infrastructure and operation of getting the farmers growing. That's the correlation. That's the, that's the catalyst. That's the why. Is it, it supports the farmers growing against these contracts. Correct? It absolutely does. They, they, they're helping me to help them, basically. They help me. I could help them. I could sell the, the, the market. I could take their hemp to the market and sell it, have it sold within 24 hours when it's cut. Right? I mean, the farmers pay practically almost immediately. Right? So, I mean, they don't got to wait for that. You know what used to make me so mad with Dad? And we would watch the, we would always watch the farm futures or the or corn futures. And when he thought the bushel got up to three dollars and five cents, or when it, what was it? A dollar eighty-five is what it was when I was in farming, and that was in the eighty. And that's that was real money back then. We were hot and heavy about penny stocks, and we're going to continue to talk about that and how if you're a farmer, if you're not a farmer, you can support a farmer and, and support yourself by taking a serious, hard, and fast look at Ford biofuel stock today because it's not going to be what it looks like today for very much longer, and it is the support mechanism and system for supporting farmers growing against existing buyers that are waiting for farmers to grow this in a program that everyone can rely on and trust. Joaquin, I think you had some, some um, comments on the, the stock at hand. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, listening well on that and, and kind of being a, a businessman myself, uh, investing in a company and, and knowing the, the, the validity of the company and what its purpose is, you know, to me, really uh, excites me to kind of invest my money in something like this and, and be a part of it. Because I'm not a farmer myself, but if I know that I can, if the dollars that I earn, work so hard for, can go towards uh, erecting a company like this that, that can have such a monumental change, uh, I just want to make sure that everyone else who's listening is aware that this is a paradigm shift in the renewable energy resource. Uh, you'll no longer, as you go down this road, have to really mine for oil or frack or, you know, ruin the landscape, you can actually enhance it. This is industrial crop that's grown and grown and grown over and over and over, year after year. And I, and I, I don't know, sometimes it's hard for people to imagine that because we've been so used to petroleum products. Uh, I'm just super, super excited about it. And, uh, and I think that if you are a farmer and you want to support and you want to be a part of this change, investing in the stock is a great way 
kind of bridge that gap of being able to support that. And that's just, I wanted to really make that a point here for us. Well, one of the most important things you should understand is, is that the, the stock is on an American company, right? Um, the Ford Biofuel Incorporated is registered in Miami. Um, we were we are registered in Columbia, and, and we have been for a while. And we just registered in, in Miami, and we went to sunbiz.org to register. And when I checked with them the other day, they were still backlogged that we should be active in Miami any day. Fantastic. Oh, I just had another question too. Like when when I invest in the stock, like what uh, what am I to expect as far as um, like how does that benefit like maybe my portfolio or if I wanted to hold it as a part of my portfolio, uh, Mark? What does that kind of look like? Uh, you said it's about a dollar right now, or it's right at about a dollar dollar nineteen right now. The the right now, if you you have to hold it a year, right? But it does pay yearly dividends. Okay. So annually, I can, and then, and then I'm sure it'll probably increase uh, 10, 15, maybe even like 30 or $40 a stock, um, you know, as these contracts get executed from the town. That, if we were with the SEC, that would be considered insider trading. But since we're not with the SEC, like I was telling Amy earlier, and Amy was confirming with me, that the amount of money we have in a confirmed contract, uh, is, is no doubt that's what's going to happen. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, everything's going to go right. We know that because they're going to, we're going to make sure of it. The farmers right. are going to make sure of it, right? The, the farmers, the farmers know how to run a business. I mean, they they're they're raised that way. They're it's in their blood. They know how to raise run a business with their hands full of mud, is what Dad always said. But the the idea is is that when you try to move money around the world, everybody asks. What's the origin of funds, right? And one of the biggest reasons that we did the opening of the company in Miami was that it's easier for us to move funds between Columbia and us as company name to company name, like Ford Biofuel to Ford Biofuel, right? If I was sending, if you guys were sending me money from all over the United States and buying stock with it like that, the banks would go absolutely nuts down here and it just wouldn't work because they would get the money and they would sit on it for sometimes two years. And that's that's not cool. So doing it as a Ford biofuel to Ford biofuel is a lot better and a lot more simpler because of the origin of funds. You know, anytime you move money in Colombia, the banks always want to crawl up your leg and say, well, where did it come from? Is it narco traffic? Is it this? Is it that? Is it laundry? Is it, you know, I mean, they just, they're worse than American banks. Now, don't get me wrong, American banks suck also. But Columbia banks are the king of the crop when it comes to bad banks. They're horrible when it comes to holding money up. They love to hold your money and not give you your interest. That's another thing that they're good at doing. So you provided a safe haven and a reasonable program for your stockholders. We, that's why we did it in America. We, we provided a safe haven for it. That way it's, it's, it's fair to help the farmers in America. It's fair to help the, the people be able to grow, the farmers be able to grow in America. And as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, then what's going to happen is, is that we're going to bring on more farms and more farms and more farms. And whether they have one growth season or even a half a growth season, we're going to use them. We're going to work with them because every farmer that that's every farmer in my book deserves the opportunity that we have to offer to them. Even a farmer with one acre. I don't care if he's got a half an acre, Amy. If he's if he wants to make a little bit of money, I mean he's not going to make a lot, but I mean he's going to it's it's going to be worth his time. He can hand sow that, right? Um, it, it's it's. It doesn't matter if, if the farmers are the ones are the most important in this situation, right? The second most important situation is bringing the price of commodities down. For example, clothing, uh, the fuel, right? Doing the um, uh, working with the farmers so that they can afford a decent life. Again, I was raised on a farm, and I remember waiting every year 
Tim, I'm sure you went through this too. You had to wait at least once a year to get your new pair of shoes. Remember those days? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Nobody had money until the fall. That's right. School time. That's the only time you got your shoes. And you damn sure better not wear wear them when you get home. I mean, that's, that's exactly how it is still. Because you can't go to Walmart without spending $60, $80 on a pair of shoes. Right? And... It's sad. It's really sad. So the idea is is to bring these farmers together. Let's let's grow this crop. Let's make them some money, some real money, right? And then they can support themselves. They can get their farms out of hock with the banks and possibly, even most generally, get their kids put in college, if you follow what I'm saying. Some kids I know that can't even go to college because the farmers can't afford it. Right, because right? they're and just breaking Another yeah. avenue to help the, the social. This is social here. It all is a domino effect, Amy, is what it is. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing exactly what we're doing here. The model works here. And if it works here in a third world country, it damn sure will work in America. Well, let's just level set that. Um, because, you know, it was a billion dollar cash crop, you know, by popular science back in the, you know, back in the day. And now this whole CBD market craze and that crash and the unfortunate um, situation they're in. I think it's really important that we level set for the farmer and for the buyers out there, for the people wanting to transform their commodities. Really, you know, do not map over what the CBD market is or could have been or what farmers made. It's, it's, It's different. We're looking at a raw hemp material commodity marketplace. And that's, um, you know, pennies on the dollar or dollars versus, you know, tens of dollars a pound. So maybe you can just level set what that looks like and do they get to earn a doctor's salary even based on 10,000 acres? You know, let's just talk about that so they know what they're getting into. Better. Better than a doctor's you, salary. You'll make better I'm, I'm than a doctor's you. salary on 10000 acres. Oh, my God. You'll make better than an attorney's salary. You'll make more money you made in one year than you made in 10. I'm telling you. It's, it's going to okay. get the farmers out of pocket. But here's another thing you got to remember. One of the things that we really, really concentrate on are women farmers, right? We have a group of women in Colombia that are in Chigarado, right? And the company is called Sahona, and it's nothing but women that work with us. And these women put these, and I've got pictures to send you people. If you want to see them, I can get you pictures. But these women, when they plant, they plant the seed, they plant the seeds and the actual flower by hand, right? And they, they just, women, the women farmers drive me nuts, and I'll explain why. They're worse than us, guys. What they do is they'll put the flower or they'll put the plant in the ground and then they'll move the soil around it. And for some stupid reason, they don't get weeds. You know how we get weeds around our, our, our hemp? Well, the way they do it, and I, don't, I haven't figured it out yet, and they don't use chemicals in Colombia. It's illegal to use chemicals on the ground in Colombia. There's no weeds that grow near those plants. Because those women stay on top of it like a mother hen, right? And this is what I love about the, 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 women, the women farmers down here. They're tough. They take care of that crop. And we, as men, what do we do? We throw it in the back of the soybean planter, drive down the aisle, turn around and drive the bowling alley again, turn around and drive the bowling alley again, and we're not going to walk that crop, right? I mean, I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. These women, these women farmers take very good care of the crops down here. And when you guys get a chance to come down to Columbia and see our, our operation with Sahona, it will blow your mind, right, how, how fictitious they are on taking care of the crops. That, well, being, love- said, mm-hmm. that being said, that the women are doing that, that helps only that only helps us grow faster because mm-hmm. they take such good care of these crops that the, 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 the it grows fast and they're ready to plant again. I mean it's just they're fast. Well this and the 
to turn a seed to sale is what I'm trying to get at, is that mm -hmm. they get it to seed to sale faster than anybody I ever seen. Well, clearly we're bringing our system and methods to the farmer and help them be very efficient with their practices, and we're really gearing them up to grow strong with a purpose and against the contract. What I also am very present to, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're a farmer or not, when we look at the farming community and their legacy, we are revitalizing a, a marketplace and a, and a demographic and a profession that is sorely needing attention and to be put back at the helm because these are the producers of our commodities moving forward. So we are respecting them and, and providing a, pur a purpose-driven program so that the children of these farmers are able to look at farming differently and to see that is it. farming is STEM, science, technology, education, math. Farming is a part of that. And they, I am so excited to see perhaps a, a rebirth of farming families and seeing what their family has and taking hold of it as parents are hopefully praying over their kids saying, I really wish my son or daughter would take this to the next level. And now you're providing them the possibility of seeing it as um, a sexy profession to get into, a cutting edge. Like they have something, it's like diamonds in the rough. And that's what excites me. You know what we're going to do, Amy, what is going to happen is it's going to make the tractor sexy again. Absolutely. I can't wait to get on one. <laughs> this is going to be fun. I think Erin Tippin sang that song, didn't he? She thinks my tractor's sexy. You think my tractor, yeah, that's Travis Pitt right there. Oh, is that Travis Pitt? I could, I could remember. I thought it was Erin Tippin. But I remember that song. That was, she thinks my tractor's sexy. All right, we're going to make a jingle about that, Okay. <laughs> You will have to. We'll have to. The bottom line okay, guys, we're coming up on the end here. Let's see okay. if I can get a, a little we got time for some last minute advice, right? So we'll we'll start with Burke. Burke, what you got? What's her last minute advice on the last part of the show? Uh, I think it's to to bottle up all your excitement and be very focused with it, and align yourself with people that have a long term approach. Uh, to the and let the excitement kind of, I guess, guide you off a cliff. And I've seen that over and over now. And I think it's important to acknowledge the countries that have been growing hemp. Uh, we all need to to take pause and learn from them. And then if we do that, we work together. Uh, then we'll be able to build this infrastructure that you know is needed, Mark, to to fund your initiative. And then also, and not to forget fiber that's coming online in a major way. So. These are exciting times. Actually, the market now is where we thought it was back in 2016. And because none of this discussion was really kind of in the forefront, we really squandered the opportunity of those two years. We thought that if you build it, they will come. That's just not, not how things work. So it's going to take a lot of effort. And so anybody who wants to put forth that effort now, it's time for them to get in the game. That's kind of my message to the industry. Hoorah. Hey, Steven, what you got? Yeah, I'll, I'll ditto uh, Per James effect, and you know where uh, we see where this industry is going long term, and it can be the infrastructure for for many uh, many verticals in sustainable fashion. You know, keep aligning yourself with people that that it's not a it's not a fad; it's a it's a lifestyle, it's a mission. And when you align yourself with people that are are looking to do good with this plant and uh, and, and help out the, the planet and the people. It, uh, the synergies and the, the momentum and everything kind of builds and it's brought us to now. So I'm uh, very grateful and, and honored to be part of this uh, this network and this group coming together. Fantastic. We're happy to have you guys on with us as well. Kim, Kim Grubbs from uh, Miss Delta Hemp down in Mississippi. What you got for us, buddy? Closing argument. I have uh, what's already been said. I've, I'm so grateful and hopeful to be a part of this process. I'm proud to be a stockholder. I'm excited to go out and carry this message to people that um, will change their situations uh, to give them some hope. I see this as a social justice model that's going to 
vastly shift the way that we interrelate and the way that we are able to help one another again. It's it's really just phenomenal. I, I could not be more excited to be a part of it, Mark, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, we're happy to have you with us, Kim. You just don't know. Well, Keenan, what you got, buddy? Uh, yeah, in closing, uh, you know, uh, being a part of this uh, this uh, whole segment here just makes me want to be a farmer, uh, to be honest. You know, this kind of seems, uh, seems like this is where it should be or where it should have been. And uh, and then the, the farmer support infrastructure, the, the commodity market, the way that uh, I see this paradigm shift of natural resources uh, just really kind of helps uh, reestablish what America was founded on with its agricultural beginnings and kind of going back into a time where, where uh, you know, we probably had a lot more uh, stability in our in our market and in our country. So I just look forward to seeing, uh, seeing and supporting Ford Biofuels uh, in the future and helping it grow as big as it can be. I love it. Well, we thank you. We thank you, Shay. Which was just yeah. want to put in some words there for it. Yeah, Shay here. You know, I I love everything you had to say here, and I I got a little phrase that I was thinking about. We're making uh making America great again with this farming, and I think it's it's amazing. And you know, just uh, you know, coming from your background, and you born and raised on a farm, you know, you're you're firsthand passionate about this, and you know, I come from a family business as well, so I understand the traditions that it takes to keep the family business alive, and you know, that's heritage within our, you know, it's heritage, and I think it's amazing that you know this plant's got so many positive benefits on all aspects of life, and you know, it's all positive, and the synergies are there, and you know, it's time to be alive, and it's time to really push the envelope, and we're we're happy to be a part of this, and you know, any ways we can contribute to get this. Ball all moving forward, we're a part of it. Well, well I tell you, we're here at Fort Biofuel. We're so excited to work with every, every one of you guys. Uh, we're, we're ready, ready to move forward to get this done and help our farmers. And of course, last but not least, Mrs. Ted X herself, Amy Ansel. Put in your last two pennies there, girl. <clears throat> My dreams are coming into reality, and it's just a privilege and honor to be in service and support to a global agenda. And I believe in my heart of hearts that everything that I've been through in my life, in my professional career, has put me into this position where I absolutely burst with fruit flavor over everything that we're talking about. I mean, you guys know how passionate I am for healing and transformation on every level and that we are disruptors as well as facilitators. We're here to facilitate and disrupt and to provide, you know, law and order and system and method and to help the Fortune 500, to help the Fortune 50 stay at the helm where they're at, transforming their commodities or else they're going to be shut down. So we have a huge agenda and we're here for the little guy. We're here for the big egg farmer as well. We have the contracts and the, the team is, is coming into focus and this year is so bright and full of promise and, um, you know, look for Ford Biofuels and take a serious, long, hard look at those penny stocks because that is going to be the fuel that fuels biofuel. There you go. Amy, thank you so much for that plug. Uh, everybody, um, I, I'm looking at my, my bottom line counter here, and I see 1.6379 million people listening to us just on the web. I, I couldn't tell you how many people are listening to us on the radio. And I just want to reach out and say you know, thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to us. Um, I know we kind of rambled a little bit, but it was worth every minute of it. I know you feel that way. Otherwise, you still wouldn't be on listening to us. Unless you're getting a good giggle listening to us. I, I don't know. But, hey, make sure you guys do this. Go out to YouTube and look up Amy Ansel for TEDx. Uh, watch, her, watch her. How many videos on YouTube do you have out there at your TEDx? Oh, just one, Amy Ansel, TEDx. Okay, just the one? Yep. Okay. Go out there and give her a look at. Give her a look at and subscribe, because there will be a lot more come up here very soon um, for her. But, again, guys, I really appreciate it. Happy, happy Martin Luther King Day. If you're going to grow out, eat a hamburger for me. This is Mark Ford speaking, and I look forward to seeing and hearing from you guys real soon. Y'all have a great night and a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless and take it easy.